project by the Energy Development Agency. Um, and since then, he uh, has retired prematurely. Maybe you can explain something about that. Um, and he's been working uh, in a large think tank, probably maybe it's one of my biggest leading think tanks, the ORF, um, which is the Observer Research Foundation. Um, he has some very interesting things to say about um, India's position as it faces um, the need to increase its energy availability in the face of uh, desperate poverty in many parts of the country and large numbers of people that um, really cannot be uh, expected to stay at such a low level of energy use. Um, and how does India deal with that problem at the time that uh, the world is very concerned about climate change? Uh, so what I really appreciate about reading um, the pieces that I saw and um, yesterday I had a wonderful lunch uh, discussion is, uh, is I think quite uh, provocative ideas about uh, what, this, what position the Indian government should take uh, in climate negotiations and uh, how the country will balance its need for energy really in quite a difficult position with such cheap and available coal reserves uh, at the same time as uh, India is under uh, increasing pressure to reduce its emissions of carbon and carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. So welcome to the Watson Institute and we're glad to have you here.
But there is something more dangerous happening. See, in between, there's a lot of uncertainty. Uncertainty on climate policy. Uncertainty about specific directions policies will take, whether within nations or between nations, where climate change negotiations really turn into hard trade and commerce negotiations. With the shape of those unclear, what is happening is the pace of investments in extraction of resources is slowing down very, very rapidly. And that has been further exacerbated by what happened in 2008 and 9. That was a great downturn. Investments not just in conventional energy, but even in non conventional energy and more particularly R&D, crucial R&D into non-conventional energy fell down drastically. Energy prices in the conventional sector fell, that took away a lot of attention immediately and at the same time, long-term investments in producing, extracting fuels in the quantities which may be required, one must understand that you have a time cycle for investment. If you're investing in conventional fossil fuels like oil or gas or coal, your investments today start only yielding fruit eight, ten years down the line. Now, when demand picks up four or five years later, you might land up in a situation where 148 dollar oil actually ends up looking very, very cheap. Now these are IEA figures and this, what this really tries to show is since 2030 in spite of whatever we are trying to do, the major share remains with the commercial sector. You have liquid fuels which is oil and you have natural gas and coal. They continue to dominate the energy basket. The bottom, uh, the, the, the top portion which is showing you that relates to nuclear and renewables. Renewables pick up, but they pick up very, very slowly. I'll go into the reasons why that happens. Just again to get to the global picture, this is what the energy basket of most prominent countries looks like today. And you can just compare across them. Uh, China and India, yes are dominated by coal, China more than India. Most of the other countries, USA, EU, have gradually shifted away from coal because they did have access to alternate fuels like natural gas. A natural gas anyway has a carbon footprint half the size of coal. It, it is the cleanest form of energy. But that diversification, that kind of diversification <coughs> will still take a lot of time in countries like India and China. So they are going to be stuck with coal for many years to come. Just a snapshot of what is the emissions profile across various countries. As you all know, China overtook USA sometime in 2006, 2007 and became the largest emitter. Then you have EU. India, as far as total emissions go, still are about 1.2 gigatons compared to around 6 for both US and China. Now we look at what is the emissions profile per unit of energy across countries. How much emissions does a country generate for every barrel of oil, the oil equivalent that it uses? Uh, China again rates very high there, as much as three tons of carbon dioxide per unit of energy. The other countries are fairly okay, between 2.4 India's 
just about 2.2. This has to do a lot with the pattern of energy use. What is the energy being used for? As a country gets more and more dependent on, say, transport, and that's a personalized transport, the emissions profile rises. India is at this position today, I do not think it's going to stay there forever. You will definitely see a jump there. Per capita comparison is a very touchy subject. Mm. I'll not speak much about them, but yes, you can see where the various countries of the world are as far as per capita consumption goes. And now that is one of the major debates which keeps taking place, uh, which took place in Copenhagen, which has taken place in Bali, as to what should be a strategy for a future global climate treaty? How do you share the carbon space? But what do these figures really mean? Why, why is there so much variation? And just as an example, I'm showing you the energy curve for China starting right from 1965. Now something starts happening with China after 1990. And you suddenly see a steep rise, a little decline as China went into some problems, and then again after 2001, suddenly things shoot up and shoot up dramatically across the entire energy space. You know, coal develops very rapidly, but consumption of oil, hydro, nuclear, they all rise. What what is happening? It's 1993. China, which was self-sufficient for the first time, starts importing oil. It enters the world market buying oil in huge quantities. By 2002, China has overtaken Japan as the second largest consumer of oil. By 2006, China, which has huge coal reserves, actually starts importing coal. Now that is very, very relevant because the next the major resource competition for the years to come, now this we are going to see in the oil space and the coal space, and it's going to happen between countries like India and China. By 6, 7, China has overtaken US as the largest producer of CO2 emissions, and its energy consumption has crossed the entire consumption in the European Union. And the reason is there has been a total explosion in the country's heavy manufacturing capacity. The investments in infrastructure have multiplied many fold. Till 2003, China has been importing steel. Within three years, from a steel importer, China converts into the biggest exporter of steel. Its production grows by two and a half times within this space. Until by 2007, 36.4% of all the steel being produced in the world is just coming from one country. The same thing happened in cement. By 2007, 50% of the cement being produced anywhere in the world, all over the world, comes from China. Coal consumption story is much the same. And why is this happening? Between 2001 and 2006, China, there is a large amount of export yet growth, yes. China has become the manufacturing hub for the world. But besides that, besides all the export of products it is doing, of steel, of cement, there has been a surge in infrastructure, infrastructure spending across the length and breadth of China. And China itself is a major consumer for most of the commodities it is producing. And that is one of the reasons why China was not hit by the downturn as much as was expected. Now these are comparisons for China and India which are very, very relevant when we start talking of the relative positions of these two countries with respect to climate negotiations. Where do they stand? Often I'm asked, you know, China and India are making common cause. They have a lot in common. Do they have a lot in common? Actually, they do not. They are very, very different. They may have been cornered into taking a particular position under certain circumstances, but they develop 
segment profiles, their needs, their future needs are very different from each other. In these six, seven years I'm talking about China's annual energy demand grew from anywhere, annual energy demand. Every year the energy demand was going from a least of 7% to a maximum of 16%. The years where Chinese, China's energy demand grew as much as 16% in one year. India's energy demand during the same period, 2001-2007, which again saw very high growth in India. We are talking of years where both countries were talking, China was talking close to 10% growth, 11% growth in certain years. India was averaging between 8-9%. to Within these years, India's energy demand was just going steadily at about 3 to 3.5%. That's roughly one third of the economic growth rate. In the case of China, it's something like 85% of the growth rate. See, that is because of the pattern of growth. Right. The growth trajectory was very, very different. The share of manufacturing and industry in China's energy demand was as high as 71%. This entire energy demand came from the manufacturing sector, from the industry, from industry and particularly from this very hungry heavy industry. In India, it was just 16 percent, and the share of coal and fossil fuel emissions is 82 percent, 68 percent. The largest contributor to GDP again in China was industry, with a share of as high as 48 percent. Whereas in India, it was the services sector which saw this phenomenal growth, and particularly the IT industry, which ultimately was both of them combined contributed 54 percent of the GDP. But this now has implications for the future. In Copenhagen, both China and India made declarations to the effect that they would be cutting down the intensity of their emissions. China said it would reduce its emissions intensity by 40%. And India said it reduced its emission intensity by 20 to 25 percent by the year 2020. To my mind, there are major problems with India's commitment. Why I'm going to tell you. This shows you change in the energy demand across both these countries from 1965 to 2005. China, we saw that surge between 2001 and 2006. India's, as I explained, was a much steadier growth. What are these units? These are uh, oil equivalent. Oil equivalent. Million, million tons of oil equivalent. Now, where is India positioned in the growth trajectory? That is the question we need to ask ourselves. And what does the future hold? Are we going to see the same steady kind of growth? Or is this pattern of energy consumption going to change? And what are the imperatives if it changes? What does it mean when we talk about emission intensity per unit of GDP? And how, how do countries across the world look like? When we are making commitments, what are we committing ourselves to? The emission intensity per thousand dollars of GDP, right from 1990 to 2006 across countries, India, in real terms, is next to China. If you look at it in PPP terms, that is purchasing power parity, if you're comparing GDP in terms of actual goods produced and sold, rather than the currency they denominated in. Uh, the picture changes slightly, and the, the shape of the graph doesn't. China still remains very high. You have an emissions intensity which starts you know, roughly about 1.3, 1.35. It dips between 2000 2001. Up to 2001, it is falling. And China is the only country in the world where, in these days, if you look, if you look at this period between 1995, to 2006, where the emission intensity actually rose for unit of GDP. It did not fall. 
every other country, except the Middle East, where it was rose slightly, every other country has been a progressive decline. The intensity of the economy, the energy intensity of the economy, has been declining. But India has a more remarkable story. It has declined across the world. But in the case of India, the emission intensity actually fell more rapidly in the second half of this period than it did in the first half. Across the world, the picture was different. Whether it is the US, whether it is the EU, the decline was more in the first half and less in the second half of this period. Just if you look at the slope of these lines. Was, there, was, the, was the pledge made at Copenhagen in purchasing power parity or was it in uh, GDP? And it does not matter because it was in percentage terms. Okay. Yeah, so there's a, whatever number you look at, it's a percentage. So the, that figure does not change. The pledge remains the same. Okay. So these are just, um, whether you look at it in PPP terms or real terms, 25, 20 percent emissions cut in emissions intensity will produce the same results across both. <coughs> now this why this happened in India was precisely what I was talking about an entirely service sector that growth an IT industry which was booming which was really bearing the brunt of development during that period the question is, is that pattern going to continue are we looking, it's, it's very easy to extrapolate a straight line and say there should not be any problem in India maintaining this rate of decline and attaining 20% cut in emissions intensity. Well, if that were to happen, India is, will be below the US shortly. Now, this is a big debate which people are facing in India, services versus manufacturing. Now, you have, on the one side, you have 10 million people entering the workforce every year. On the other hand, with the IT industry, this is Bangalore and Infosys. The total employment in tech services is between 1.6 to 2 million, not more than that. Where are the rest of them going to get their jobs from? This big divide between the blue collar and the white collar. There has been an economic boom, but it's been built on the shakiest of foundations. You have problems, there's no highways, bridges, airports, you look at the state of the power infrastructure, it is virtually collapsing in cities. Now that shows the state of the grid and that shows the state of the transport infrastructure. Now these are areas which are going to need major investments in the years to come and going to need it in the next 5 to 10 years. Otherwise, I think India has been left out of the growth story. And if you are going to invest in infrastructure and manufacturing, your emissions intensity is not going to come down, it's going to go up. <coughs> uh, overall fuel consumption, as I said, is dominated by coal. I won't spend too much time on this. But the problem of fuel poverty, we talk of lifestyle changes. There are lifestyle changes which are needed here. Very, very important lifestyle changes. Uh, this is up from where I come, the hills of Uttarakhand. Uh, very sensitive picture from the gender point of view. The woman's burden does not decrease in either case. But on the one hand, I mean, she is carrying these daily head loads. Maybe every three days she is going out to the forest. If you look at the background, you can hardly see any trees. The trek increases every year. On the other side, you see these same women carrying LPG cylinders. They have to do this trek, it's a, maybe a 10 kilometer trek, and they do it once in maybe one and a half months, once in two months. I think it's a no brainer as to which way the solution lies and what should be happening. How are you going to remove fuel poverty? Are we going to, on the back of this fuel poverty, come in with schemes and declarations? saying, no, we shall only give them two, 200 million improved bookstores. Or are we going to say that no, 
let us transform the lifestyle and let us at least give them bottled LPG to carry home. Now, there LPG is natural, natural gas, right? Yeah, uh, no, LPG no is pressure. not natural gas. LPG is butane. Is bottled it? gas. What you got to know is bottled gas. Now, this is both programs, whether you give them 200 million food cook stoves or whether you give them LPG, they're both subsidized programs. There are subsidies involved across both. One kind of subsidy is encouraged, that is only encouraged under your carbon trading mechanism. The other subsidy is not encouraged. But fuel subsidies have a different problem. And this is a very interesting slide. You see, the purpose of fuel subsidies in India was primarily to give the poor man access to fuel. Fuels like kerosene and LPG. The consequence has been that LPG has got more and more concentrated in the urban areas. And strangely, as oil prices rose, the share of subsidy, the amount of subsidy which was being given out across the board, the share of LPG and kerosene has declined. And the larger volume of subsidies has started going to products like diesel and motor theft. HSD is diesel. Yeah. Because prices of these commodities were capped, were controlled after, you know, uh, after 2002, 2003, once it started rising. But as prices kept on rising further, the share of the subsidy, total subsidy going into these products, we found that the higher share started going to products like diesel, which probably did not need to be subsidized. And why was that happening? Suddenly, diesel consumption in India started shooting up by 6 to 7 percent a year. All other products were growing at 3%, 3.5%. What was happening? Industries which were actually consuming furnace oil with generating power started switching to diesel because that was a far cheaper source because those, those prices were controlled. Because India perpetually is in the grip of a power crisis. Every the redundant generating capacity in the country is more than one third of the installed capacity. Redundant meaning the backup storage capacities, whether you have it in generating sets, whether you have it in small inverters across the country, everyone lives on them. The total power generated last year was about 750 terawatt hours. That is annually, the, the yearly figure. Of which 68% came from coal. Now, how much does this really translate to when you talk of per person electricity generated? It's a miserable, not even 0 0.07. The figure was actually 0 0.0625. That is the amount of electricity which is available per capita. And this, this electricity is not only something which he's using to power his house, it, it means printing his books, making his clothes, sending their child to school. Everything. This was the net share of electricity available for any kind of business, manufacturing, or any activity in the country. How much is it compared to Chinese figure? Uh, Chinese figure was at the, at, the, at the moment is about uh, 1.5. Now, for a minimum poverty alleviation goal, a minimum poverty alleviation goal, we're talking of very bare minimum needs of people being satisfied. You at least need something like 0.25 kilowatts. And that much power has to be generated. And this, if, if you can attain 0 0.25, it still is you know, just a quarter of what it is in the European, in the European Union and one eighth of the US average. But just to reach this figure of 0 0.25, if you want to reach it by 2030, India needs to generate four times as much power. You need to reach a figure of 3,250 units from the current 750. What, what are the options? This 
is the 2009 picture. The total power generated out, generated on Envoy. The one uh, pie chart shows you installed capacity, and the next one shows you actual generation. And this is interesting because the installed capacity often gives us a very wrong picture. What really matters is how much power is actually going into the grid from which source. How much usable power is going into the grid. If you look at it, 53% of installed capacity is based on coal. But when it comes to actual generation, 68% comes from coal. <coughs> we talk a lot about renewables. The share of renewables as far as installed capacity goes is 9%. When it comes to actual energy generated, it's under 4%, 3.7 actually. And that, that is because of obvious plant load factors. And that those are, when we are talking of switching over to new fuels in the coming time, these are figures we have to keep in mind. And these, these are not figures which are going to change. And these equations are not going to change. Now that is where India's critical problem lies. What does coal-based power actually look like by 2030? It's, you have reports from the Planning Commission, the Integrated Energy Planning uh, Report, which says India will pursue growth trajectory, no problem, we have abundant coal resources. And we will certainly be able to, you know, do mass industrialization of the base of coal. So there is a major problem there. And my central thesis is that more than anything else, it is going to be very hard resource constraints, the availability of resources, which will eventually cap India's emissions. And our projections are that those emissions will finally be capped at about 4.5 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That is well below China, well below the US, well below many other advanced countries. And how much does it mean in terms of per capita? Per capita would just be about three tons of carbon dioxide compared to the US's 20. And that is where the cap will be reached. So this whole debate of not agreeing to a cap, in my mind, is totally redundant. Cap or no cap, there is a ceiling you're going to hit. And you're going to hit that ceiling because of hard resource constraints. What do you mean by hard resource constraints? Um, that's what I was going to say. See, to reach these 3,250 gigawatts, and I'm taking very optimistic predictions, provided we can do it. There are big questions whether we'll be able to do it. But I'm taking a very optimistic scenario. I'm saying India continues to grow at 8%. It continues to add coal fire capacity at the rate of about 10 gigawatts a year. The ultimate target by 2030 is about 300 gigawatts of coal fired plants which will be set up. And presuming that they become more efficient, at the moment they operate at 72% efficiency, I'm also presuming that they start operating, you see you have your super critical boilers for them. So they start operating at 85% yield. India would be need, uh, needing about 1.4 gigatons. That is the amount of coal it requires annually. Now, to reach this figure, coal production needs to grow by 43 to 45 million tons annually. The current rate of growth has just been about 18 percent. With the coal sector in the state it is in, I do not see India being able to attain this figure, so it is going to depend upon coal imports. Even if it were to expand its production capacity, say, from 18 to maybe 30, the constraint lies then in handling and transportation capacities. Your freight corridors will not be able to carry the coal from the mines to the power stations. The obvious very clear answer is why not go in for more pitted power plants? India should therefore be installing more and more pitted power plants. But it's not that simple. India, I think, has reached saturation point as far as pitted power plants are concerned. Not for any other reason, but because they do not have water available. The constraint is going to be water. And you need huge quantities of water to set up these power plants. 
So you will end up transporting coal from the coal extraction centers to the demand centers. In spite of everything, India would be needing about 400 million tons of imported coal against the 30 it required in 2010. Now looking at the global scenario, the total coal export in 2007 across the world, the total amount of coal exported was 800 million tons. China is also there waiting for coal imports. Who in the world is going to invest in production capacities to the extent to be able to give that coal, especially when there are major bottlenecks, policy bottlenecks in expanding coal capacities across the world? Which country is going to do it? The total reserves in India, we are talking about extractable reserves, proven reserves. Proven reserves is not more than 100 billion tons. The figure that for for prognosticators is actually 250. But proven reserves are 100. Most of it, at least 50% of this, cannot be mined because it is in areas which are inaccessible, either because of your environment laws, they are under forests. Or you have cities like Dhanbad sitting on top of them. You cannot mine that coal. And most of the coal being mined in India is actually in open cast mines, it is not underground mines. So, you reach a point by 2030 with this state of reserves where the state of coal reserves, the extent of coal reserves itself, limits new capacity addition in coal fired power plants. So you reach about 300, 350 gigawatts and then you peak there. And that is why we come to this figure that there are resource constraints. There are resource constraints which ensure that India's emissions do not exceed 4.5 gigatons. Some other solutions have to be found. You have a very ambitious nuclear program which is a three-stage thorium-based cycle. Currently, it's just a total of about 2.5 percent of electricity generated comes from nuclear power plants. The current capacity is 4.2, and uh, if the government of India has believed, they are targeting 40 gigawatts by 2022. That is uh, where the plan is. Now, we have done an analysis of where we are in this cycle and we can be certain that India's daily target date will skip by at least 10 years. 40 gigawatts will not come before 2030 to 2032. And there are reasons for that. See, the reason is because of the nature of the three-stage cycle we have chosen. The gestation period, the state of development of technology. But even if India does 40 gigawatts, by 2030, it is nothing to be laughed at. You know, it is, India has established in, by that period four major nuclear technologies, which then place it on a path where it can upscale nuclear technology beyond 2030, so that by 2050, the picture emerges far, far better. So you have you know, the pressurized heavy water reactor, the fast media reactors, the light water reactors, and the thorium advanced heavy water reactors. These technologies have then been established. The constraints which lie in this area are that fuel processing capacity needs to expand by at least five times. <coughs> Otherwise, you do not get into this, uh, you need this 40 gigawatts. And the bigger concern is there is hardly any capacity as far as public funds are concerned with the public sector undertakings to invest, make investments of over dollars 200 billion. So there has to be a very, very clear roadmap, which means specific <coughs> policy changes. There is a lot of talk about collaborations coming in nuclear energy. A lot of countries are interested. But most countries today are interested really as service providers, as contractors. For investors to come in, there has to be a very clear roadmap for generating resources from India's private sector as well as public sector. 
And if that happens, then we do reach 40 gigawatts, not by 2022, but by 2030, 2030. Oh, so So what, by 2030, where do we end up with this? You have a generating capacity, if you look at those 300 very optimistic figures of 300 gigawatts, you're still dependent about 55% on coal, mm -hmm. which in terms of electricity generated is giving you about 63%. The share of renewables has grown to 10%, but the power generated, the electricity generated, still remains around the same, 3.5 to 4%. So the net share, the percentage share in the fuel basket does not really increase. Now if you were to reach a 10% share in actual generation using renewables, I mean that's often asked this question, what, why, why are you not talking about renewables? To reach a 10% share in actual generation, over 25% of the installed capacity would have to be from renewable sources. Will that be? Will be, will have to be from renewable sources and not 10%, 21, fourth of the capacity. Now, which has major implications for investments because costs as far as wind are concerned per megawatt are the same. Solar is about, you know, many, many, many megawatt times more expensive. So given the current state of technologies, yes, there are problems. That is why you are still stuck at about 10%, generating about 3.4 to 3.6% renewable energy. Nuclear starts generating about 9%. Now the playoff can happen between coal and gas, which can further change the emissions picture favorably. If gas kicks in more, but if gas were to kick in more, where does the gas come from? Almost finished. Where does the gas come from? After 2002, there have not been any major discoveries. For Generating even the units I'm showing here, India would have to import almost 200 to 300 cubic meters of gas. Either that comes as a energy, or that comes for these transnational pipelines we have been talking about. The transnational pipelines, geopolitics is one issue. I think a bigger issue is neither Iran nor Central Asia really look at India as a preferred gas market. If they are looking at gas markets, they are preferring Europe. Because Indian gas markets do not, will not give them the prices they can get with this and, and the gas prices. So this is not a preferred market. So eventually, what remains is, you have a coal-based trajectory of growth. On the positive side, because of resource constraints, development, energy security, climate goals are actually converging. They're, they're all converging at this figure of 4.5 giga, giga, gigatons of carbon dioxide. Now, <coughs> India will cap its emissions at far lower levels than the rest of the world. The only game changer which can change things is non-conventional gas. And non-conventional gas not I'm not saying non-conventional gas found in India. Non-conventional gas found in the USA is as good because it releases larger quantities of gas from other areas. If Central Asia starts looking at other alternative markets, if Europe, Poland find, finds huge quantities of shale gas and starts exploiting it to reduce dependence on Russia, that is good news for India. Maybe the energy basket changes then in favor of gas because you get access to more gas far more cheaply than you're doing at the, at the moment. And of course the biggest gains which are going to come are going to come from sheer efficiency. Efficiency in energy use which can bring about 20% to 30% more energy and carbon space available. So India can do far more with that three tons per capita of carbon dioxide, the carbon space which it has, than it would do in an alternate scenario. So that is where 
we reach a situation where I think this entire conversation, this debate we are having about cap on emissions has to be looked at in a totally different light. We need to look at the problems from within, to look at the resource situation which a country like India is facing, and then see what would be the best climate strategy which we should